that they were virtually street by street, synagogue by synagogue, character type by character type, political event by political event. Uh, I think, I really do believe the time God who saw his task in literature as to undo, if at all times, to do the impossible, just to undo in literature what had happened in history. That is, to provide a three dimensional present tense portrait of Vilna as if it were still alive. And when you read these novels, there's never a hint or an intimation of, uh, of the subsequent destruction. There are never any flash balls from the interwar period to the Holocaust. The narrator seeks to talk as if he doesn't know what will happen to his characters. And another feature that enables that is that Grada's novel can thrive on conflict. It's always the internal struggle of a character, change to escape their flaws. And then there's a conflict between characters, between neighbors, between rabbis, between husbands and wives. And it's the focus on conflict that prevents from descending into romanticism or nostalgia. Uh, pre war Vilna is always conflicted. That means in all its vitality. There are very few saints among the hundreds of characters who've got a kind of Russian novel uh, of intertwining characters. There are very few saints, and only two saints that come to mind are his mother, the Amishan, and his teacher, the Kazanish, and the Dalkong, the Maximum Kazanish. Brazit, as I would put it, communed with Vilna for 34 years in his apartment on Gale Street, near Central Gaddafi. He was actually quite lonely in America, never really felt lonely. Uh, the real world, real life, real joy, was there before the war. America was fake, America was superficial. Even Jewish life in America for him was a caricature of real Jewish life. Uh, one of its characters in the third part of the Mamashal, the response part, is a uh, pediatrician named Anna, a survivor of the ghetto, and a, a pediatrician right after the war. And she says it in fact. Every survivor should commune for the rest of his or her life with one murdered friend or relative. And never let go of them, never let them out of their mind, forever for the rest of their life. And she says, men are entitled to live in their minds with their murdered girlfriend, and their wives have no right to be jealous. I think God is upon that mission put in the mouth of Anna in community, but not with one murder person, two murder people would really be an uh, entire murder community. Uh, one of his colleagues once said about God, he paraphrased a statement by Stendhal, Stendhal, the French writer who wrote a book, the uh, Charter House of Parma, who said in Parma, Italy. Stendhal supposedly said, Parma is in Parma, Arnold is where it arrives. And uh, this Rebecca Kabbalah said, Vilna is in Vilna. Vilna certainly is in Vilna. Vilna is in high ground. Uh, a few personal remarks. Uh, we became friends in 1979. I too, like Eric, graduated from came to Harvard. Lecture, so we knew each other just for the last three years of his life. Um, some ways we were opposites, bumping into each other. Uh, he was a former yeshiva student uh, who became a secular Yiddish writer. I was raised as a secular Yiddish and religious and was attending yeshiva university. But we found a lot, uh, because of that, sort of opposite directions, we found a lot of what to uh, visualize him. Uh, he had a rather coarse, raspy point. He was a rather querulous kind of person. When he talked with you, he showed friendship with kind of physical uh, gestures. He sort of punched him on the shoulder. Uh, walking down the street, 
gesture blindly uh, to stop in the middle of the street just to, to make a point and wait a minute or two to continue walking. What I'm saying is, you could see the signs of the forming of sheep on the Indian, this being almost 50 years after he left that. Uh, his suits look, his clothes, and he either looked rumble on him, or they looked like he had just bought it when he was getting married. In other words, never, it never got comfortable. You could look, still see, I think, the person who had grown up in that Jackson Palmer and didn't quite uh, know how to, to dress uh, and, and the, uh, the conference. Um, all of this being said, the man of tremendous erudition, not only Judaic erudition, but world erudition. He had a tremendous collection of world literature, Russian literature, of course, the original. Of course, I did this so many times, so many things in library, Russian literature, the original, uh, the world classics, the various writers, both, uh, and of course, Spinoza, his most beloved, in many a lot of Hebrew books. What struck me actually was for a Yiddish writer, he didn't have a lot of Yiddish books. Uh, the last and personal comment I'll make is his relationship with his body. He had a custom every day, one half hour was devoted to his body. What would he do? He would take the shelf and move it around to another part of the room. While doing so, he would examine the books of that one bookshelf of the day. And this way, he said he felt he was, they weren't just standing there. He had a relationship. He would keep rereading books. The, the bookshelf, which appears in several of his poems, uh, was really a uh, vital part of the book. focusing on building a monumental task for the world of life. His other great accomplishment is his depiction of rabbis. Uh, there were rabbis in the Jewish literature before Chaim Gazin. There were many. And there were issues in the Jews before Chaim Gazin. But they, I don't think they were ever really developed in character. Uh, most of these rabbis are either uh, a skill in parody, defining them as a Meredith and or they're these kind of idealized, romanticized uh, images that you find in the Their other rabbis are both rabbinic and human. That's like a paradox. Uh, you know, the people show how their learning and their theology are intertwined with their personal aspirations, their personal frustrations, and that everything they do is a reflection of both learning theology and personal uh, aspirations. And you can show the conflict between rabbis of different temperaments and different philosophies and different personal. And his great work, the yeshiva, is really, as it was, uh, was originally called in the first volume, Yiddish, Tzemachat, which is really about two characters and a third character, two rabbis, Tzemachat, on the other hand, and the young high school Wilhelm, which is my rabbi himself, one between them. And the two rabbis represent two world views. Uh, is the Muslim, the father of the Muslim movement, who wants to achieve perfection, who is brutally honest towards himself and towards others. He will tell us the person to their face everything that is wrong. He's not really caught up with rituals in trap, but he's caught up with character. He says at one point, I'm not interested in, in chicken, whether it's chicken is kosher, and interested in whether the person is kosher. Um, he's energetic, he's not compromising, but he's gnawed away with doubts and temptation. The doubts are about actually whether there's any God at all. Praise and grows his beard and pain, more and more doubts, whether there's a God and whether the Torah is true. And his temptation, and these are the Rosh Hashim in a small little town, 
uh, he's drawn to a map of his life another city. And instead of running away from them, takes the heart to he is going to fight his temptation to have this affair. The Chazonish, the Matadel Prophet, is in many ways the polar opposite. He is uh, a man at peace with himself, with God, um, with his community. He's against the guest always has to describe uh, negative motives. Uh, and he has tremendous compassion for other people's suffering. Uh, so, uh, Isha is a bit here, although old and frail, but Shofi comes and says, Rabbi, they say the meat I kosher, uh, I slaughtered what the kosher, the Hamanish gets up and says, I'm coming. He's asked both for meat. I'm coming now. He gets up, he walks in the rain into town to, to, uh, to say And it's these two, if you want, they symbolize kind of philosophical extremism as opposed to a uh, person who is committed to principles, but one of those principles is compassion and the other is uh, acceptance of people as they are. Um, Finally, something about Rabbi's own, um, own uh, relationship to Judaism is very uh, surprising to him. Uh, he never went to him. Uh, I might have a special case of the Bible, but he did go to him. Even on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, he was usually up in the Adirondacks. They had a summer when they rented there. He would probably recite the prayers to himself, but he never went totally undeserved. We would meet in different places, but one of those places was Donald, and, and he was much away in Hamburger. Uh, he would talk with me, and, uh, and uh, sometimes Joe would say, come on, it's kosher, go ahead. <laughs> um, I want to conclude with what I think there's some of the drinking, but just what he did talk about is uh, that he very much regretted not settling the biggest mistake of his life, and in fact, he wouldn't talk about his other big mistakes, uh, but he did talk about that. Uh, he had many friends in Israel, Salman uh, Shadar, the president, the third president of Israel, uh, he knew Hebrew, of course, very well. His works were translated into Hebrew before they were translated into English. They were authorized translations. He read them and checked them. Um, and he has a book of poetry, by the way which is all devoted to poetry about Israel, about truth, about the about the sea. He was very, uh, yeah, very regretful that he had to settle there, but he had two explanations why he had to. One was that he couldn't go to Israel as long as his teacher, of Hazonish, was alive and lived there in the Nebraska, which was in 1933, he was alive. He said, as long as my teacher was alive, I couldn't go. Because I'd have to go and see him. And what is clear for that? There would have caused tremendous pain to my teacher who would have seen that I was standing up there. Or I would have tried to become religious again in order to uh, rejoin my teacher. And I didn't want to do that. So I couldn't go to this until the late 1950s after my teacher had uh, died. The other thing he said, which I think is my party, Reflection on it. He said, and you know what? If I had gone to Israel, I wouldn't have written all those novels about the If I had gone to Israel, I would have remained a poet, and I would have written lots and lots of poetry about the land, about the present, about this uh, remarkable thing that is Israel. And I would not have looked to Vilna, and I would not have looked to the past for my inspiration. And he said, you know what? Vilna deserves it. One writer that should devote himself to this. So it's a great writer that thanks the fact that it's a That's what it means in America to commune with Bill Nunn and with the rabbi and the And though I'm sure for him his life was uh, harder and less gratifying, for us as readers, we are very much enriched by the fact that he wrote.